RTE Soccer Women's World Cup podcast, sponsored by Cadbury. For grassroots to national level, a supporter and a half of women's football in Ireland. Turn the world round, shut the show down. Welcome along to the RT Soccer Women's World Cup podcast. Raf Giallo here, and the clock is ticking to the start of the tournament and Ireland's opener against Australia on Thursday. That fixture at Stadium Australia in Sydney will be live on RT2 and RT Player with coverage underway from half 10 in the morning, straight off the back of the 8 a.m. kickoff featuring the other co host, New Zealand, who are going to be up against Norway, and also every other game from the tournament, from opening game all the way up to the final, will be live on RTE to, um, to watch as well and also there will be radio coverage too. And now tomorrow we're going to be previewing Ireland-Australia in depth, but today we're going to largely focus on the World Cup as a whole, including the leaders, the leading contenders and some of the dark horses. And to do that, I'm joined by former League of Ireland footballer Conan Byrne and Anthony Pine of RT Sport Online, who's just made the journey from Brisbane to Sydney. Not so much jet lag this time, Anthony. No, piece of cake. This one, just less than two hours. So <laughs> you're up and you're down. It was like uh, flying to Newcastle or something. <laughs> yeah, a lot, yeah. lot easier than than, than the, the old trip from Dublin to, to Brisbane. So we're, we're on more of an even keel now. We've got a week raft to find our bearings. So yeah. We're getting uh-huh. there. Yeah, and Conan, you've been very busy in the build-up as well. I mean, I was uh, I don't give a lot of likes and stuff on Twitter, as I told you, before <laughs> we hit record, but I made a rare exception here for your um, your Twitter thread, which was basically a really good explainer of the tournament for people who maybe are just coming to it for the first time. And I guess that was your motive behind it. Yeah, like, like I'm a primary school teacher, so I've been speaking to a lot of parents at the school gates about the upcoming World Cup. I t- we took... Um, this, the girls soccer team out to the UCD training session, open training session just before they left, before the France game and the Zambia game. And um, yeah, it just came from that. They were just saying, oh, I don't really know much about it. And I think we can get caught up in the fact that we expect to know a lot about the Ireland's women, uh, the Ireland's women's team. Um, but in, in the truer sense of the word, it's a World Cup. Some people only get involved in at that stage. And you can go back to Italia 90 when... Everybody jumped on the bandwagon at that stage. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where the idea came from. And I just said, look, in, in preparation for the game on, on Thursday against Australia, I said, look, I'll give a little backstory to the players, um, who they're going to be coming up against, what I think the team selection will be, and 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 some of the, the tactics that I think Pau will, will enforce in, in, in their game plan. So, yeah, it kind of blew up a little bit. Um, but, yeah, that, that's, that's why I did it. And, um, yeah, glad that it's seems to be um out there now for people. Colin, are, are you in, teaching Rush? Yeah. No, I wasn't in Izzy's school, though. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask, is there a bit of hype around Izzy? Um, I'm sure. There is. Like, we we did, Um, I got a couple of the girls from from Rush um that that have played, that play for Rush Athletic team that Izzy played with and, and from the, that, that are in my school. I'm in Rush National School. And, um, yeah, we just did a, sent a little video over to her, so you can ask her about that actually, because we uh, mm-hmm. we sent it to her, and um, yeah, just to say that we're very proud of her as um, she went to the school up the road St Catherine's and um, was part of Rush Athletic as well. So yeah, it's great to see Izzy at the World Cup, and it just inspires the the girls in in that in that community and and look all over all over Ireland as well when you see players like that. You know, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and when you mentioned Rush Athletic there, it brings up to mind the picture. So obviously they did the, the normal squad photo on the jersey yesterday with the entire squad, but also before that, there were um, photos and it, there were kind of special ones where every player was wearing the first jersey they wore for the first club that they represented as a child. So you have um, Diane Caldwell in a Balbriggan um, FC shirt, Denise O'Sullivan with Wilton United, Katie McCabe with Kilnamana and Amber Barrett wearing Milford and so on and so forth. And yeah. it goes, it's a way of showing, I guess, the grassroots element of, that has actually led all a lot of like most of these players, bar maybe the, the players who've been sort of natural Realized, um, from you know the the very foundations of the game all the way to representing the country at a World Cup. Absolutely, and um, um, it just goes to show how much they love the game because they would have had to have played with um boys, um, the majority of the time from under sevens up until under thirteens. Um, 
on when they had to when they had to change and just looking at the jerseys there, three from my local area in Fingal, like you have, as I said, Diane Caldwell, Jamie Finn and the Swords Manor jersey and, and Izzy as well in, in the Rush jersey. So great to see that local presence. But like all over the country, as you said, it's it's just fascinating. It's just so incredible to think that um you have girls that have that are going to be playing now in a World Cup that are inspiring so many of the next generation. And that's what's going to happen. We're just going to see an explosion of um young girls and boys wanting to play the game now. And I just really hope that clubs are ready for them. Yeah, and also supported, I suppose, financially as well with uh, with investment too, with whether it comes from facilities or otherwise. But um, um Anthony, there is good news in terms of who's going to be playing um against Australia. Denise O'Sullivan, you know, we were talking about her on yesterday's podcast in terms of her availability after that injury she suffered against Colombia. But the good news is she's on track to uh, feature in that opening game. Yeah, yeah, remains on track. I mean, just just another positive update today. But uh, as expected, you know the the noises around the camp for the last two days have been been pretty good, and and the players, you know, without giving too much away, or Vera Powell. I mean, Vera Powell couldn't come out and say she is going to start Thursday because she didn't know. To be fair, uh, she can only follow the medical advice. But it was certainly. From Saturday onwards, actually, it was like, look, we're, we're hopeful, you know. She was never 100% real doubt. There was no fracture. It was soft tissue damage, which is painful, but um, recoverable. Uh, and the latest is today. She uh, Yesterday, she was in training, but it was more jogging and a bit of stretching, nothing nothing too intense. Today, I think there was a little bit of ball work. Uh, tomorrow, she's going to be taking part in the full session. Uh, and that would really lead you to believe that she's going to be OK. She's going to start on Thursday night uh, in Sydney. Yeah. And in terms of the the news in Australia through the papers and things, I know you were perusing them so, sort of almost James Richardson, Football Italia style. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, without maybe the, the croissants and the, the coffee yeah. <laughs> out in the cafe. The glamour. But, yeah, <laughs> without, yeah, without the glamour. But um, you wrote a piece for RT.ie that people can read there where you kind of you look through what's being said in the media. And look, I, I guess there is a growing and burgeoning interest there. Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like, I mean, I got to say that with, it didn't feel, it wasn't exactly World Cup fever in Brisbane, just in terms of when you were out and about and even speaking to people, anecdotally, like a lot of people weren't really aware of what was happening. But Australia is such a, a vast country that you can kind of understand that. Um, Sydney is the hub of it. And I, I think even today, we took, I took a short stroll earlier on and down towards Darling Harbour and and the branding and, and some of the, you know, they're preparing a big fan zone down there. And, and there's a real feel that this is, you can feel it, you know what I mean? You can feel it. And I, I think from what I speak to other people around, like some of the Irish bars and, and uh, uh, Irish areas around the, the city that it's, it's building visually and, and just a lot of the families and the friends have jetted in here today as well. Like I know one of the other journalists, um, Kathleen McNamee from off the ball was, uh, was down at the opera house and she asked somebody to take a picture of her and it turned out to be Courtney Brosnan's family, <laughs> you know? So it's like everybody's congregating here now uh, and it's building and it's almost upon us. Um, I think in the piece I, I talked about, like some of the papers, a few a few of the outlets have mentioned Ireland's physicality and, and Australia prepared for Ireland's physical approach, renowned physical, physical approach, a lot of language like that which uh, I, I thought was a little strange, to be honest with you, given that five days ago, Ireland were basically kicked off the pitch by, by Colombia. Uh, and, you know, I watched Fran- I watched Australia play France last Friday night, and they're, I mean, they're a physical, they're a powerful team, you know, in a good way. You know, nothing wrong with that at all. They're, they're quick and they're, they're strong. Uh, and they themselves are a physical team. So, but there seems to be this, they're almost, I don't know if it's like an anxiety where they don't want to, they're desperate not to underplay Ireland. They feel like they should beat them, which they, they are favourites to beat them. They should beat them, really, on paper. And they know that, and they're the co-hosts, and they're desperate to go off to a good start. But it's almost like they're they're terrified of being seen to underplay Ireland. Uh, so there's this sort of thing, well, you know, we got to be ready for them. They're going to bring a fight. They're going to be physical. Uh, there's a lot of that going on. Maybe maybe it's mind games as well. I just, I just thought it was interesting because, you know, Australia are an excellent team. They really are. And all being equal, they will win the game on Thursday night because they they are one of the top probably six, seven country nations at this competition. But um, it will be very interesting if Ireland get an early goal or take the lead because 
you know, that breeds a real anxiety and pressure on Australia. Um, it can get flipped around, you know, playing at home when you, when you have all your home fans, it's great when it's going well, but if it goes a little wobbly, uh, it can crank up the pressure on you. So that's why that's what I would be hoping for from an Ireland perspective. That they get if there is going to be goals, Ireland need to get the first one. They really that, that's critical. Yeah, because that brings us nicely into the sort of general overview of the tournament. Um, obviously, when you're looking at the which are the strongest groups, Ireland are in a very tough one. I was looking at the uh, just did the sort of highest average ranking within each group, and the USA's one has the best average ranking of uh, teams in that group. Obviously, they have the Dutch and Portugal and Vietnam in there, and the average ranking is uh, fifteen point seven five. Ireland's is actually next on nineteen point seven five, and then England's group on twenty one. And um, Conan, when you look at say you know that Ireland group, there's not a lot of margin for error given the Olympic champions Canada are in there, and then there's also a wild card like Nigeria who granted have had their issues in terms of uh, the issue of bonuses but um, are yeah. also a very strong team yeah the most successful team in Africa um, and like you say the Olympic champions Canada and then the, the, co- the, ho- the co-host of the World Cup Australia and I think with Anthony saying that the top six top seven in the world I think by them being ho- by them hosting the competition it nearly puts them up a little bit further um, and with the quality that they have like even just going quickly on the game on Thursday, it's as I said, but with the tread the other day, it's 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 all I think down the side is going to be really it's going to be a fascinating battle, as I said, between Eddie Carpenter and Katie McCabe, two of the best players in the world up against each other. And then on the other side, then you have Heather Payne, who's kind of adapted her role as a striker and gone into it in, into that full back position, wing back position, and up against Steph Catley, who's absolutely phenomenal player as well. So and then Sinead Farley, again, only two caps, but with phenomenal ability on the ball. Um, but I'd always worry about that fitness issue at 33 and not having those international experience behind her. Um, and then, as I said, with Steph Catley up and down that wing, it's going to be, it's got, that's where I feel as if we, we, we may struggle in that area. Um, and if I was Australia, I'd be playing two tens because you don't know, as a back three in, in Ireland, with the Ireland squad, you don't know who, Who's going to go in and take that ten when the likes of Ruicha Little John's going to be taking one? You want Denise O'Sullivan kind of on the half turn getting up the pitch, um. So who's going to go in and take that that ten position? Um. So that's it's a very interesting tactical battle which I'm really looking forward to seeing. But yeah, like you say, it's it's I think call it the group of death. Um. I know you said with USA with the, with, the, with the Dutch and the Portuguese and and Vietnam obviously in 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 that group it's a very very difficult group. But I can only see one winner in that group, and it's just m- mainly. The other teams of how to qualify, but in our group, I think obviously you might you fancy you do fancy Australia to win it, but then with Canada being Olympic champions and the uncertainty around Nigeria, and then the Irish, you know what we're like at at, at the at World Cup tournaments and and how we're the underdog and we pre we we kind of love that title, um, and it's going to be really inter- interesting to see how we get on. Yeah, and you mentioned the United States there, obviously being favourites in their group. And I mean, they're, they'd be facing the team they beat in the, the last final, the Dutch. But it's interesting, like the older generation are still there, the likes of Megan Rapino and Alex Morgan, who have been superstars for a long time. It's going to be their last hurrah for the most part. One would expect a couple of younger players like Sophia Smith. But um, I was just looking at the squad, the ages within their squad, and only seven of their squad are 25 or under, and uh, 10 are 30 and over which suggests either and I don't know how you look at this Conan whether it's a case of maybe doesn't look like there's a huge wave of young talent coming or is it just a fact that this older generation are such a special group of players that they have so much staying power yeah it's experience as well and Andonovsky the, the USA manager has talked about the three A's their attractiveness uh, their attacking play and also their aggressiveness so um, that's what they've been discussing in, in camp it's though is the importance of those three fundamental principles in 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 their play um they're also trying to make history by becoming the, the the only team in both men and women's to win three consecutive world cups on the spin so again something to be fighting for um you mentioned sophia smith a wonderful wonderful player and um, part of the portland thorns team that won the nwsl um mvp championship game mvp like 11 goals already for for usa this kind of year and she's still only 22 but I think she's going to be probably the star of the World Cup, if I'm being completely honest. I think um, she's just going to... I really do rate her as a footballer like, like everybody else. Um, 
and then also Trinity Rodman down that right hand side as well. Um, any fans of basketball will probably know their father's Dennis, um, more of a defensive player, but with Trinity more of an attacking player and her pace and power down that right hand side. Actually scored against Wales in a friendly a couple of um a couple of months back. So um exciting to see how she does at, at such a young age. So yeah, you do have that youth, but then with America, as I said, you do not do you need do need do need that experience too when they have it in abundance. Yeah, and Anthony, I mean, if let's say Ireland were to get out of um, Group B, there the pathway is the uh, the Group D teams basically are the opponents in the next round, and with this, and that would involve England, but also a very tough group that also has Denmark and China. We um, we played China earlier this year in a nil all draw in uh, Marbella, I believe. Actually, you you were at it if I if I if I recall correctly, mm. but um, even like England themselves are strong have huge depth but they've so many injuries as well so it'd be even fascinating what happens if uh if ireland or whoever comes out of ireland's group um were to get into that last 16 against those teams well yeah uh, can i do i'm gonna do a james richardson and prep my football italia impression first draft before i get into that because there is okay we maybe we don't have to watch this world cup at all there's a story in the back of the uh australian uh newspaper today uh, a data and analytics firm called nielsen has done um, you know they've done crunch the numbers on this right they've done a million simulations of the entire tournament so usa 18 percent chance of winning okay they're their favorites as uh, followed by sweden and germany at 11 percent ireland zero percent i'm sad to say uh but 22 percent chance of getting out of the group uh, is what they're giving this Nielsen uh, firm is, is giving us. So um, 22%, uh, we'll, we'll take those odds. And as I say, if we do get through, like if we want to get out of this group, it's it's one of the great, it's one of our great football achievements. It's up there with anything that we've ever done. Um, and if we did set up a, a game with England, the last 16 match with England at a World Cup, unbelievable. Can you imagine what that would be like? It's just absolutely incredible. We'd also have, we would have kind of form lines because we drew with China in February, as you mentioned there. Um, you know, still not not a great game, but uh, they didn't create any chances. We didn't either, but you know, uh, deserved draw against a good team. Um, we have uh, Australia in our group. Australia bet England in April one nil. They were excellent that day, Australia, which is ominous for us. But again, you know, if we manage to get out with this group, we we we'll, we'll have played Australia and Sydney by then. So. Another decent form guide. And you might get to the point where if everything goes really well and we set up a game against England, you'd be thinking, well, we've got, we really have nothing to lose here. Um, and one thing you will say about Ireland, and Colin's absolutely right, like you can pick holes in, in the, the approach. And some people have said Verpel is a little overly defensive. It's taken us this far. Um, there's not a lot of goals in the team, but I'll tell you what, like they, they are incredibly resolute and they're very hard to break down. Like I think the game against France, where they lost three 0 that was a bit of an anomaly. Uh, two of those goals in first half injury time. First one was, you know, just just a bit, just a bit of bad luck. Generally speaking, they don't give up many goals, and and I don't think anybody's going to enjoy playing against them. You know, really, like even you know, you can sense with Australia, they will expect to win, and they are expected to win by their own fans. But uh, I think there's a. Uh, they would see it as a potential banana skin. And I think they would be r- probably right to, to do it like that. Yeah, and uh, Conan, speaking of England, I mean, and maybe the European Championships weren't that far um, far away in the, they're, you know, they were only about a year ago and, and probably quite informative in terms of, especially, the, well, obviously, the European teams. Um, England obviously went on to win it, um, but they're without Beth Mead, Fran Kirby, Leah w- Williamson this time. And there were other teams that either, like Norway, who underperformed badly, but seem to be getting back to an even keel. You have the Dutch who are, you know, where they had a reasonable tournament, but they're without Vivian uh, Miedema, who's a, you know, superstar striker for them. Germany flew under the radar a little bit last time and they got to, they got to the European championship final, but they're not really expected to win it, uh, win, you know, to win the world cup. And you have Spain who have had some ructions as well in terms of, you know, player av- availability, but they still have some, great players like Alexia Pateas and then you have France who we saw firsthand who have some great players but also similarly to Spain have their issues in terms of ructions between well pr- the, with the previous management team although it seems like a happier camp this time like what's your read on those sort of major European contenders um 
yeah, I think England, I think have to be up there with with uh, potential champions. Like I, I think that has to be a has to be a talking point in the sense that they're ten from ten from qualifying, eighty goals scored, none conceded. It's an impressive tally. Uh, no matter who the opposition are, um, so they are a formidable outfit going into this going into this World Cup, and um, I think another player to look out for would be Kira Walsh. Obviously, Siam Man City player went to Barcelona. Her quality and possession, the way she, her passing, her technique, it just reminds me, actually, she's at Barcelona, but she reminds me of um, Busquets in, in the male, male role. Um, just the Norway, or the way she dictates play and the game. So she's going to be a big player for them. And someone that might might not kind of get all the headlines, but, but Lauren James as well, I think, has, has had a good season with Chelsea. Um, I think... She has a good opportunity. Maybe she might start, but she definitely make an impact off the bench. And given their form at, at the World Cup England, like third in, in 2015, and um, they got to the semi-finals in uh, 2019. And then also the way they um, obliterated some of the teams in in the Euros, um, the likes of Norway 8-0, Sweden 4-0. Um, and these are big, big tournaments, big games. So it just goes to show that they are um, quality in those big bigger games and bigger tournaments. But like you said, the loss of Kirby and Williamson and Mead are, are going to be huge, huge for England because some of the, like Beth Mead is irreplaceable. Um, that'd be England. Sorry, Anthony. No, no, sorry. I was just going to, just on that, um, again, sorry, I keep wrapping back to Ireland, but just, you mentioned England um, in the Euros um, and those really impressive games where they picked up steam as they went on. But their first game was against Austria and they bet them 1-0, and it wasn't convincing. Um, but it's just the, the point I'm making is that it's another reason for a little bit of optimism for us, because, you know, the first game in that position as hosts or co-hosts, co -hosts, um, that's when the pressure, there's such pressure on, on a team like that yeah. that's expected to start strong. It's, you know, it's just something, again, we're, we're, we're looking for every bit of optimism we, we can take. from But it is just worth thinking about, because on one hand, you're saying this is the, a really difficult game for Ireland, probably one of the worst games we could have got first up. But then again, if you're going to get Australia, you're probably better off getting them first up. You know, well, you look at our previous history in the World Cups and at, at, at levels of 94, we joined stadiums, we beat Italy, who, who went on to get to the final, you know. So yeah. we are the underdog nation, we 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 thrive off that. But at the same time, it's a, it's like the, the other thing we have to say is that. The, the girls, the Irish girls have never played anywhere close yeah, yeah. to the amount of people that they're going to be um, playing in front of on, on Thursday. But yeah. uh, going back to your, your point, Raph, I think like I've talked about Norway's um, poor performance at the Euros in, in 2022. And it was mainly an, an embarrassing, really, losing to Austria as well. And then the England demolition. But they should top their, their group, I think. Uh, the defeat, their defence was weak in the Euros. Um, and I think the the, the manager Heg Risa, when he came in in August 2022, it, he was that was his job. He was number one priority was to shore up that defence. And look, it looks like they've done that. Um, they've held teams without conceding a goal. Big big European nations. They drew with England one all. They drew with France nil all. Um, so they're big big results going into this competition. And herself, she was a um. Like he was, the, she was the greatest ever player for Norway. Won the World Cup in in 1995, so she has plenty of experience at World Cup level. Um, and then the return of the players, Carolyn Graham Hansen, who's gonna, I think, is gonna have a, a really, really big World Cup. Um, obviously coming in, she's previous manager playing her as a as a number ten, more of an attacker. But I think Risa Caesar is the player that she is, wide player coming in off the left hand side. Um, she'll score goals, big goal threat. Um, but also the assist queen. She's um assist players for fun so really looking forward to seeing how she goes how she gets on in this World Cup so yeah I think my my underdog maybe would be to to get far in the competition would be Norway but only because a lot of people are writing them off considering their Euros Euro exploits in in, uh, in 2022 one. Yeah. yeah and the Spanish as well just in terms of you know because Barcelona have been very successful at club level and you know Pateas has won but then if you look at all the other kind of Spanish players that are that are there whether it's Hermoso or Bon Mati they have a lot of ball playing quality and they were class against England albeit got knocked out in the Euros but they they were probably the team that pushed them closest yeah but and, and again they're 
rife with internal problems as well. I think it was 15 players in, in 2022 resigned from their inter- in, from the national team and <laughs> did it via social media. Um, so like there's doubt about their top top scorer as well, Patelis, done her ACL, FIFA's best player for two years consecutively. Um, so it's gonna might be a different squad altogether that qualif- that qualified for this World Cup. So we we'll just have to see how how they get on. But with Hermoso, I think there's pressure on her to to succeed. Um, kind of experienced 32 year old playing in the Mexican league with Pachuca, Pachuca. Um, but like with her experience, her goal tally, I think it's 48 goals in 97 games. Um, and then also really looking forward to seeing parallel well, parallel well, though. didn't say that right, but um, really looking forward to seeing how she gets on. Um, she only called time in her athletics career last July, so she's a, a sprinter, um, from Zaragoza, um. Yeah, just in terms of like, imagine giving up, a, having a sport, so like two combined sports and the transfer of skills that like we talked about so many. We tell our, tell our uh, young boys and girls to play as many sports as they want. But this girl, like completely focused on football now, but nearly kept her athletics career so long. And within a year, then she's playing in a World Cup with Spain. So really looking forward to seeing how she gets on. Um. So yeah, I think Spain, I don't know. I, I'm just conscious of... of they're internal problems, Raf. Um, so, as I said, they may they may not be the same team that have that qualified for this competition, and certainly not the team that that we saw in the Euros either. Yeah, and I think the other um, the other dark horse that um, Sue Ronan, the former Ireland manager, went um, on our podcast a couple of weeks ago. She she suggested Japan, who are of course former winners as well, um, as a potential dark horse and one that could um, that maybe people aren't really talking about as well. And it comes at a time also with the expansion of the game where. Um, Anthony, I mean, um, this is the first World Cup that'll be thirty two teams, so we've got. Um, an expansion by eight, but also coincidentally eight deputants um, taking part. So this is all about growing the game as well. There's um, there's nations like Panama, the Philippines um, that we'll we'll see properly for the first time. Yeah, Vietnam, I think, are, are another one. A, a team like throwing worth maybe mentioned in terms of potential surprise packages, not not to win it, but maybe just take some people by surprise and, and get into the knockout stages of Zambia. We, you know, we saw Zambia a few weeks ago. Uh, I was really impressed with them. I was really, really impressed with them. Like they, they're going forward from the midfield up. They are great to watch, and they have uh, Barbara Branda, who is has the potential to be one of the outstanding strikers at this tournament. You got to remember as well uh, with countries like this, um, they're all trying to earn a move. They they, they want to come to Europe. You know, they want to play football professionally. Um, Barbara Branda is currently playing in China. Um, a lot of the other players are are. are Part time there, and but there's such great talent, you know, and, and ability. But they're they're all they're all playing for moves, you know, they, their dream. And this is sort of where the game is at. Like the game has has exploded and and come on so much in the last couple of years. But there's still so much room for growth. And a lot of players at these tournaments, particularly with some of the countries that you just mentioned there, Raf, you know, they just want to play full time. They just want to be able to have it as a, as their job to 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 play full time and professionally. That that's that's their big goal. So there's going to be a lot of very uh, talented and extremely um, motivated players at this at this tournament, and also by the way, I should probably mention that that extends to Ireland because we have a number of players who are currently without clubs, you know, who are actually out of contract, you know, and, and are trying to they're, they're all in the shop window. Yeah, and interestingly, you mentioned the well, obviously us beating Zambia three two, but then they went and drew three all with Switzerland, who are another team in the World Cup playing in the uh, in Group A where they'll be uh, yeah and then bet Germany 3-2 away so again yeah Yeah. um, as you say they could well be a surprise package and as you mentioned Barbara Banda there um, Conan I mean this is a you know World Cups it's also you know we're talking about the collective but there's also the individual side as well I mean you have superstars that people will latch on to like Ada Hagerberg Sam Kerr obviously is the as the host nation Alexia Patelis that we uh, mentioned earlier and then it's going to be a swan song of, short, of sorts for some absolute legends of the game like Canada's um, Christine Sinclair who we'll see um, up close when she, uh, when she comes up against Ireland there's Marta who is one of the you know one of the greatest players um, in the history of the women's game and then of course Megan Rapinoe as well who's both like a cultural as well as a on-field figure as well yeah and Ali Riley as well, the New Zealand uh, defender is, is our fourth World Cup and um, she's played in four Olympics. So yeah, and I think 
it, this might be the last time you might see those um, really experienced players at the likes of 35, 36, 37 that are going to be playing in the World Cup because these young players that are coming through now are so mature in their play and um, and their experience as well. They're, like with the, with the coaching that they are now receiving at underage football, you can see players coming in at 15, 16, 17. Ellie Carpenter making her debut for, for the Matildas at 15, for example. Um, so yeah, I think this could be the last year. Like you're, we could be sitting here now thinking, um, like 32, 33 year old players will have another World Cup in them. They may not because with the quality of girls' football and how it's just becoming a, a huge global game, and it's fantastic to see that you may not have these players that are going to be playing at 36, 37 now in the next World Cup. So the likes of um Hermoso, for instance. Um, at 32 this could be her her swan song too even though you might be saying Jesus surely she's going to have another World Cup in her um, but yeah it is it is fascinating when you look at it these fantastic players that we may see for the very very last time um, and they're going to want to go out on a high um, but I think Rapinoe will have the, the last laugh yeah. that she'll uh, she'll get the another World Cup medal yeah. under her belt well, according to Nielsen Conan uh, it's in the bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah and if i was to push you on a, a on a finalist that they could meet um obviously you're saying usa to win but um who do you think will be uh will push them closest look i'll be honest i don't know the uh the way the draw goes um and i know it can be different if you finish first and second and all that but i i do think the way with their big game play their win at the euros um i do think england have a wonderful chance of of getting to a world cup final um and I'm not saying they're going to win it, obviously, I said USA, but going one better than they've done in the previous two World Cups. So um, England, I think, will do do really, really well. I probably would have, my outsider may have been Spain, but that would have been last year before the the, the internal problems that, that were happening because they put it up to England. They were absolutely superb um, in that game and they were dominated possession for, for the majority of it. Um, so... Spain are a bit unfortunate, and I, I honestly, honestly do think Australia will do really, really well. Um, being the host nation, and yeah, I think they'll get out of their group, um, pretty easily. If I'm being honest, um, my that's my heart telling me that, um, or my head telling me that, should I say? But I, I not again. They won't. I don't think they'll win it. But I'll put a semi finalist tag on Australia. Okay, we'll see how they go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry, no, I was, I was just going to say that they're. I think they're potentially on a collision course with France in the quarters, Australia. So, so that that would be the thing. If they actually if they get over France, you could they'd be thinking. Yeah, well, they beat them at the way. weekend. I know. Yeah, so. I know. Like it's it's a friendly and and all that. And that's an, another player that I wanted to name. I think Mary Fowler is is going to have a wonderful tournament as well. Coming off the bench at half time, you'd wonder then if 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 she has made us and and scored. It'd be interesting to see if she's going to start the game on Thursday, considering the impact that she had. Um, and yeah, what could have been her yeah. cavern father yeah. if he had it just pushed her a little bit more? After. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite possibly. But anyway, we'll be we'll find out how this tournament unfolds from Thursday. As I said, live coverage from eight a.m. with the opening game between New Zealand and Norway, and then carries over into the live coverage of Ireland against Australia. We're going to be doing a bumper preview of that game tomorrow. Mikey Stafford will be uh, will be chairing this uh, tomorrow. So uh, Conan Byrne, thanks a million for taking the time. And Anthony, um, get some sleep because I know it's getting late over there. Thanks, Raf. Turn the world round, shut the show down. Supporter and a half likes, shares, comments, and tweets. Cadbury sponsors RTE Soccer Women's World Cup podcast.